Hello and welcome to the Moms Who Know podcast. I'm your host, Chanel Nielsen, and I am super excited about our call today. We have Jennifer Finlayson Fife on the call. Jennifer, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Yes, and I should have said Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife to really get her <laughs> intro right. She is a licensed psychotherapist who specializes in relationship and sexuality counseling. So I'm excited to really get into this topic and really talk about some things that I feel like will be helpful to our listeners. So to start off, I would love to just know a little bit about you, uh, kind of your background, your career, what got you interested in going this direction in your career and anything else you want to tell us about yourself? Sure. Well, let's see. I, um, I grew up LDS, um, a member of the LDS church. And I was really interested from an early age, just in how relationships work and also in particular in marriages. And so that was just kind of an interest from a very early stage. And and then I, when I went uh, to college, I studied psychology and women's studies because I was especially interested in women's lives and, and women's experiences. And then I went on and, um, you know, I thought for a little bit about becoming an architect because I do really love that. But um, I served an LDS mission in Spain and saw a lot of women who were in abusive situations and suffering. And it, coming back from that, I really knew that counseling and working with couples and also women uh, was my passion. And so then I switched to a psychology major, studied women's studies, and then I uh, went on and got a master's and PhD at Boston College. And I wrote my dissertation on Mormon women and sexuality and their relationship to their own sense of agency uh, in their sexual lives. That is to say, kind of their sense of their ability to be actors um, as sexual beings, as, a, as opposed to just their sexuality existing for the sake of men. So I looked at the narratives of Mormon women and looked at differences between um, women who were thriving within the within the group and women who were not thriving. Okay, that is really interesting. Now, when you say you were interested in marriage and relationships for from a young age, what aspect of that is, interested you? Like, I could say that too. I was very interested in relationships, but from yeah. the from the from the perspective of I was boy crazy and I was a romantic. Like, I always I just was so excited to someday be married and I wanted to have that kind of relationship. But is mm -hmm. that the same kind of interest you had or on a different level? That's interesting. I, I was a romantic in a sense and probably still am, but I was also a skeptic much more than other people okay. around me were. So I also, you know, had a kind of skepticism around the narrative that I thought I was being offered culturally that you just get married and everything will go well because I was observing a lot of people around me and in some respects, my parents' marriage and seeing the division in it and the unhappiness in it. You know, I'd see people at church that would have like, you know, six kids sitting between them and they were on either end. <laughs> <laughs> and and yes. just I had this sort of critique that I wasn't sure people were as happy as I was being told in my some of my church classes that, you know, you were going to be once you got married. So I... I don't know exactly why that was in me, but I was always thinking about what made people function, what made people do the things they did, what made people happy, how I could be happier. It was just kind of like a, a I don't know, just a curiosity and interest that I thought about a lot. And so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. I love that because it, you can see how that from a young age, you know, that analytical mind looking at these relationships then led you to see what you saw in Spain, you know, and not just mm -hmm. brush past it, but to really see it and then have that be part of your life's yes. work. Yeah. Yes. So in your practice, you're working with a lot of couples, uh, a lot, mainly couples or women yes. on their own? Uh, bo both. I, I work with individuals, men and women. Uh, men sometimes also come to me individually. Um, but I would say probably 60% of my practice is couples and then the other 40% is individuals, but okay. I really have a focus, which is, uh, helping people with their relationships and their sexual relationships. 
Right. Jesus. Okay. Well, that is, mm-hmm. I would love to start there then and to talk about, you know, things basically that would keep those married couples out of your office, things that you wish that couples knew and things that couples can do to keep their, their relationship strong, both their, just their marriage relationship, but also their intimate relationship. Can we start mm-hmm. with that? Just things you wish sure. people knew. Sure. Well, first, I would actually want to say that I don't think that somebody ending up in my office means anything's going wrong. And and what I mean by that is that, you know, there's forging a good relationship takes a lot of effort and it takes a great deal of willingness to see oneself accurately and to deal with who one is. And the one of the limitations that we have as human beings is we tend to create meanings or narratives around who we are that is makes us palatable to ourselves on some level. We tend to, or maybe a better way of saying it is we tend to create meanings around who we are that often inhibits us from moving forward in a different way. So what's often happening when couples come in is there is a meaning conflict. They are in conflict about who they are who they see themselves to be and who their spouse sees them to be. And so when that's happening, often people really do need a third view in the room. They need another perspective to be able to break out of the way that they're trying to address their challenges, but getting nowhere. So oftentimes people are trying to do something, but they can't see their way out of the struggle that they are stuck in. So that sort of leads to your question, which is, you know, what is it that I wish, you know, what do I wish people knew? I mean, I guess I wish that people understood that when they're in conflict, you know, a lot of times people will come into my office and they'll say, we have a communication problem. We can't communicate. We talk past each other. We don't understand each other. Um, and you know, maybe we've married the wrong person. And do you think I'm with the wrong person? (laughs) I, I get, you know, that a lot. And I would say that what I wish people understood is that the conflict is a function of what they need to work out in their own development as an individual and as a couple. That is to say that people never have communication problems. You know, that is to say, if they need to go to a speech and language therapist, (laughs) then they've come to the wrong person. Okay. (laughs) It's not that they can't communicate, you know, even not speaking for three days is a massive communication to your spouse. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, it's a very effective communication. I want to make you suffer, right? That's what they're saying. And you don't even have to speak one word to really induce suffering in your spouse. So people are communicating. The problem in marriage is that you don't like the message you're getting when you're unhappy, that your spouse won't see things the way you want them to see it. They won't see you the way that you want them to see you. They won't validate your view of things. And so often when people are in conflict, they're, they're vying for whose view of reality is going to prevail in the couple. And, and so they're in a control struggle. It's very unintuitive and difficult to be willing to look at, but extremely important if you're going to move forward to look at what you can't, what your spouse understands about you that you don't see about you. Wow. And also That's powerful. To, yeah. yeah. What they see about you that you don't see about you. That just brought That's it all right. home. Okay, go on. That's right. Yes, exactly. Because, you know, we have these blind spots to ourselves. And, you know, assuming your spouse is not trying to manipulate you, because I can speak to that in a minute, but they are trying to wake you up to something that's hurtful or problematic. Most of us will just, you know, fight to the death (laughs) to get our spouse to, you know, validate us and see us the way that we want to be seen rather than really see our own immaturities or our own selfishness or our own, you know, um, limitations. And it's, it's, it's much harder to try and take it, shoot the messenger than to actually deal with your limitations. But if you won't deal with your limitations, they will, they will, um, they will undermine the marriage fundamentally. It's your limitations that undermine marriage. People that are very limited aren't able to have good marriages. People that don't know how to love aren't able to have good marriages because who they really are shows up in the marriage and makes it very hard for their spouse to be happy with them. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Definitely. 
So it's, it's whether or not you're going to let marriage teach you and help you grow up. And those of us who will yield to it and will learn and will develop ourselves are much happier than those of us that will, you know, take the other person down first or get divorced and go try again and, and find out that you show up again to the next marriage. So, you know, it's, it's a fundamental human problem. Yeah. Now, I don't think that that's something going into marriage and back to your earlier point of, you know, we get married and it's happily ever after we have this this idea. I don't think that I've ever heard someone say, let marriage teach you that marriage mm -hmm. is this teacher. We don't think I'm getting married to to be taught. <laughs> we right. don't think that. And that that really is so much of marriage is learning. And if you have that idea that concept that you're going to learn from your spouse and that this marriage, this family life is a training and a teaching process, then you're going to be so much better off in your marriage. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You won't resist the lessons as they come, so to speak. Most of us get married because we're trying to lock in someone to love us, right? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and we kind of, our promise is, I will love you as long as you love me first and better. <laughs> I mean, seldom do we really r fully take in what we're doing, which is to promise to really love and care for this imperfect person who will sometimes disappoint us, be annoyingly different than us, and you're still really committing to care for them. That's a much harder thing to really acknowledge. And sometimes it takes us a while to really choose to do that. Yes. As you're talking, this experience keeps coming to mind. My husband and I, when we were newly married, we went to a, it was like a, a low ropes course. And there was this, mm. um, it was like a two ropes and they started off together and then they widened. So like a, two sides of a triangle. And mm. we had to hold on to each other and walk down the rope. So we started off close and then we started getting further and further away. And I always remember this experience because in the first a lot of couples went before us and they were telling each other, oh, you need to hold on here and do this and do this. And my sweet husband, as we're going down, he's saying, how's that? Is that okay? Does that work? Should I move my arm? And he was, just to your point, he was willing to be taught. Mm -hmm. And that's just how mm -hmm. he is in our marriage. And I've learned a lot from him. And that's why mm -hmm. we have a strong relationship because of that checking yes. in process. Yes. Yeah. He's, he's collaborative. Yeah. He's willing to sort of do what is my part that's going to allow us to succeed together. That's really what good married people do is what is my role? What is my responsibility here? And I'm not going to let your limitations uh, justify me to not step up and deal with what I need to deal with or do what part I need to do for us to succeed. Happy couples are two people working together to create a marriage in which both people thrive. Yes, definitely. Okay. So I love that. And I think that that's really helpful to people of why, you know, what we need to work on and what kind of the whole idea of marriage is. Now, when couples, I imagine a lot of people come to you because of bedroom issues, because things in their sex life are not working out great. Mm -hmm. What What are common things, common themes that you're seeing as people come in with those kind of issues? Yeah. I mean, really common themes are people who come in saying like their sex life never really worked at all. Um, that oftentimes that the woman has never really been comfortable with sexuality and never been comfortable developing a sexual relationship with her husband. Uh, sometimes that comes in with the same, that issue exists and there's a husband who has been more sexually indulgent outside of the marriage. And those two are often coexisting. Um, also, sometimes people just start losing desire for one another. They had more in the beginning of the marriage, but then kids come along, stresses come along, but also there's just growing distance and resentment in the marriage and it's impacting their sex life. So those are often the kind of presenting pictures. Okay. So on the, on the flip side, what makes a good sex life in marriage? Like what are the, what are the components or the recipe for mm. things going well in that area? Well, 
I would say that basically there's two fundamental realities that are in place when, when couples in long-term relationships are thriving in their sexual relationship. The first is I think that both parties have to be truly at peace with their sexual nature, that they have to have what I sometimes call, have to be integrated sexually. So, you know, sometimes when you grow up in a religious culture or even just in the broader culture, there's kind of an anxiety about sex. And a lot of people get sort of stuck in a feeling that sex is either disgusting or sinful or somehow makes you, you know, I don't know, makes you less than a sort of upstanding citizen. And so when people are in relationship to their sexuality that way, it makes it very, very difficult, if not impossible, to have a robust sex life because you're not willing to play within that realm. You, you know, you're not willing to really have this, your sexuality that I think of as just fundamental to being human. You're not really allowing it to be a way that you can love and be loved, a way that you can care for another and be cared for. And so if you won't integrate this part of yourself, you can't develop it. You can't be playful with it. You can't really know and be known in that realm. And many people that come into my office, they haven't yet really come to peace with this aspect of being human. So that's one piece uh, of it. And there's a sort of a female version of that not being at peace and a male version. Um, I see it more with women, but it very much can be alive with men. Um, the second thing I think is that um, I think to really thrive in a long-term marriage, you speaking to sort of my earlier idea, you have to basically be someone and be married to someone that you, that you really feel comfortable. Let, let me say it a little more simply. First of all, you, you have to be married to someone that you really want to be close to that who they are is someone you respect, that who they are is someone you trust, that you are comfortable having close to you and really letting them know you in this way. So you have to kind of know that you're partner to someone that's not messing with you or manipulating you or dishonest or deceptive. Because if you fear that or feel that, you may get through the act of sex, but it's really going to undermine how much real intimacy and openness there is in the marriage. The second thing is you've got to feel comfortable that it's okay to be known in within yourself that you're at peace enough with who you are and your body and your sexuality that you're really willing to let them know you. And so if you, you need to basically have two people that really like each other. I mean, sounds very basic, but like each other and, and for good reason, trust each other. Um, then you really have a platform and a foundation for really being creative and enjoying the sexual uh, nature of being human to really be able to explore that part of yourself and to enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. So I want to circle back around to number one and talk about how you get there, because I think that, you know, people hearing this might say, well, yeah, I want to be more truly at peace and, and be okay. And, you know, just feel more comfortable. And in fact, as I asked for, uh, questions that people were interested in asking you. This is some of the things that my, so, some of the questions that my listener, ha listeners had is how to feel more comfortable. And so how do you get there? How do you get at, tr at peace with yourself, with your mm -hmm. sexual nature? It's a very big question. I mean, in the sense that, you know, I, I teach an online course on this topic to LDS women and I really, it, it has, I'm trying to think how to give the, my succinct answer. I mean, I think what one has to develop and realize is that um, your sexual nature is inherent to being a woman. Inherent. It is not this sort of unworthy part of being human. It's not some part to sort of push away. It's fundamental to being a human being. And the more you suppress it, the more you undermine your strength, your self-confidence, and your own clarity in the world. What I would also say is living into your strength as a woman 
and living into your gifts and your and developing yourself as a person also frees you up to be able to claim your sexuality. So they go hand in hand, like really, uh, I don't know how to say this really succinctly, but um, so it means developing yourself. Many of us as women have learned how to sort of under function, to play small in the world as a way of keeping ourselves palatable, to kind of suppress our sexuality as a way of showing everyone that we're good, quote unquote. And it really undermines our ability to truly be at ease within ourselves because we're always referencing outside of ourselves and trying to be enough for those that we think judge us. So it's, it's really about taking yourself more seriously, claiming your sexuality as a gift from God to you, and then being willing to not be afraid of your sexuality so much and see it as, you know, I often talk about the fact that sex is not good or bad. Sex just is. Sexual, sexuality just is. What you do with it determines if it's a force for good in your life or not. So, um, so I think that how you do it, I mean, I guess the reason why I'm struggling with the question a little bit is because what I offer in the course I teach is I, I, I give people a whole different way of looking at that question that opens up a whole bunch of possibilities. And it's a fundamental shift. It, what I'm offering is a fundamental shift in how they think about themselves and how they think about sexuality in relationship to themselves. And when they do that, then they're more able to really open up a different way of being in relationship to their sexuality and to their spouse so that they really can come to peace with it. They start to discover a fundamental part of themselves that they have pushed away up until then. I love that, that definition though. I think that that really makes a lot of sense. And that shift in how you think about yourself, I think that makes sense because it's understanding all of the aspects of sex, which is that it's for the relationship. Yes. And it's for having children, but it's also for pleasure and to understand mm -hmm. that and be okay with that. I think that that's something that, like you mentioned, you know, it doesn't, that's not what we hear just unless you're bad or, you know, the, yes, the front of Cosmopolitan magazine kind of thing and not like the yes. good you know, Christian women we want to be, yeah. it's not like that. And so I think that there's that disconnect between Yes, two. exactly. So it's one of the things I talk about is that many of us have learned this idea that sexuality will take you down in your morality, in yeah. your, you know, that I had a client who's like, I'm afraid to know my sexuality because she sort of had this fear the next thing you knew she'd be a pole dancer or something. It's just, <laughs> she's just like terrified that if she were to lift the lid on this, it would like suck her into, you know, in more debauchery. Right. And so I think that what I say is we're sexual from birth. We are just sexual beings, period. But if you suppress it and you're in that kind of relationship, you are literally undermining your self-confidence because you're pushing down a fundamental part of being a human being and of being a woman. So it means integrating it. And by that, I mean, you really come to peace with the, that fact that you're sexual, but then also integrating it with your morality, that you're going to relate to your sexuality and to others with it in a way that you know does not undermine you or anyone else. Yes. Okay. It creates goodness. That's so good. Now, in the little bit of time we have left, I really just want to talk about and kind of pick your brain on things that women can do to improve their marriage relationship. So as some of our listeners are hearing this, maybe they're feeling like, you know, my relationship could be better. And there are things, you know, both in the marriage relationship in general or in the sexual relationship specifically that they want to have better. So what are some ways that women can just work to make this relationship better and to make it happier and more peaceful at home? Well, what I would say is, if I were to start with just one idea, I would think about what is the thing that my that I really know bothers my spouse about me? What is something that I know really is hard for them? And, um, and maybe if there's more than one thing, I'd list what what do I know is hard for them and, and to, you know, manage 
any kind of indulgent self-hatred you may have in writing that list, you know, think about what do I really think undermines my spouse's happiness? And then I would ask myself, what do I think is true in what they're saying? What do I know is true, but I sort of pretend not to know, or I try to not think about? And if you deal with that thing, you really say, I'm not going to do this to my spouse anymore. I really am going to deal with this. Not just because I know it makes them unhappy, but I understand and know in my own heart that it's not okay or it's not good that I keep doing this thing. If you deal with that, it will, it will positively impact your spouse because they will see you as someone who is willing to do right by them, who cares enough about them that you're willing to be inconvenienced for their benefit. Yes. I would, so that's step number one, and that can be a big step and a very important step because what I've often found is that when people start cleaning up their own side of the street, they're they're cleaning up their act, their spouse becomes more willing to deal with what you've been trying to tell them (laughs) all along, right? Because they see like, she's not messing around. She's actually, you know, she means it. And she's somebody who's doing right by me. And so it, it also... What happens in marriage is people will often use the the limitations of their spouse to justify their own limitations. And so, you know, when you're yelling at your spouse about what they've got wrong, but you are unwilling to deal with what they're trying to, you know, yell back to you, <laughs> you know, then, then you, you, you just keep reinforcing the self-justification in each party. Um, so when you, when you reverse that, it, it pressures the other person it no longer makes sense. It's no longer justified. Um, I would always start there. I always think that, that you deal with your half first because then you're more, your spouse is more teachable or more willing to hear it. The second thing I would maybe think about is what do I think is the most important thing for that I think in this marriage for my spouse to deal with? Meaning we can get petty, we can like critique little things, we can get annoyed by the way that our spouses are different and and have a running critique either in our heads or even coming out of our mouths. But to really think about if there's really something that I think my spouse needs to deal with that would truly bless the marriage, make it better, what do I think it is? And I would do this privately 100% and really think about what is the thing that I think undermines us? One way to get to that question is when you think about the thing you know that you do that undermines your marriage, one question to ask yourself is how do I justify doing that? What is something that my spouse does that I use to justify that I keep doing this thing? That may speak to the piece, like what is the thing that I think my spouse needs to deal with? Um, and then to really think about how do I make it easy because this is sort of in line with the same idea. How do I make it easy for my spouse to do what he does? So for example, you know, I was working with someone today, her spouse often takes a kind of superior uh, position and he's, and he withholds information from her financial information, decision-making um, things. He'll just make choices without her and things like that. You know, it, it enrages her. It makes her very upset. Okay. But what she tends to do is just sort of resent and withhold and sort of pull back and not really, you know, deal with that fact. And so when she pulls back and resents and is withholding emotionally and sexually and so on, he uses that to justify, you know, and then she kind of plays weak. I don't know how to say it differently than that. She just kind of plays little girl a little bit, resentful little girl. And then he uses that to say, you know, I wish you'd grow up basically, but he then keeps justifying his taking where she's really started to change is by being um, willing to kind of step up and talk to him more like adult to adult, not aggressively, but to say, I need to know that information because this is a decision that impacts both of us. We have to make this decision together. And he says he wants a stronger wife, but he actually in these moments doesn't want a stronger wife. And so he will often like get punitive and push back, but she's been doing a better and better job of really not getting aggressive, not retreating to her corner and being passive aggressive or resentful and just staying in the conversation and saying, 
we aren't going to thrive as a couple unless we can do this as a partnership. And I have made it easy for you to make all the decisions by me retreating and hating you for it. But, but we can't keep doing that. So that's her dealing with her part of the deal, her stepping up more strongly. It really pushes him to do his half. Yes. Oh, I, that is just so powerful, that example, because I can see how it just really shows how one person taking that initiative and making that change and standing strong and, yes. you know, staying with what is true. I thought that was a really key component of what you said. You know, what bothers mm -hmm. my spouse about me? What what kind of things are they saying? But what in that is true? And then working mm -hmm. on that, that's just so powerful because you know, it's like I tell my kids all the time, the only one you can change is yourself. But as you start to mm -hmm. do that, as you start to change yourself, then then the circumstances start to change too. That's so powerful. That's right. And what, what this woman was saying today was, you know, that she was staying steady. She wasn't being aggressive. She was, and he was getting, you know, kind of ramped up. And, but she said that he sort of checked himself. He could see that he just sounded ridiculous. Because she wasn't going into her normal place that then he could justify his indulgence against hers. When she stayed steady, then he started to temper himself and come into a more moderate position relative to her. And so that's how you change the dance between you yes. is you deal with your half. That makes so much sense. Well, I, that's so good. And I really hope that's given a lot of hope to people who are feeling that struggle and feeling things start to, you know, where they need a little work that these are some questions you can ask yourself and these are some things you can really work on. And so I, this is really helpful to people. And I appreciate you coming on and teaching us all this so much. So thank you for being on the show. You're welcome. My pleasure. Yes. And thank you everyone for listening to Moms Who Know. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode and being a part of Moms Who Know. I hope that you enjoyed that as much as I did. I wanted to let you know about some resources on the website. You're going to want to go to momswhoknowpodcast.com and go to free resources. I've recently added a brand new, it's a big, big list of activities to add to your morning routine. So if morning routine is something that you're working on, you'll want to go there. You'll see a few other resources there as well. Well, so go check it out and we'll see you next week.